This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Founder of New France, A Chronicle of Champlain, by Charles W. Colby, Chronicles of Canada Series, Volume 3. Chapter 2. Champlain in Acadia. Footnote. This word, Acadia, has sometimes been traced to the Micmac Acade, which, appended to place names, signifies an abundance of something. More probably, however, it is a corruption of Arcadia. The Acadia of de Mons Grant in 1604 extended from the parallel of 40 degrees to that of 46 degrees north latitude. But in the light of actual occupation, the term can hardly be made to embrace more than the coast from Cape Breton to Penobscot Bay. End of footnote. The early settlements of the French in America were divided into two zones by the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Considered from the standpoint of colonization, this great body of water has a double aspect. In the main, it was a vestibule to the vast region which extended westward from Gaspé to Lake Michigan, and thence to the Mississippi. But while a highway, it was also a barrier, cutting off Acadia from the main route that led to the heart of the interior. Port Royal, on the Bay of Funday, was one centre, and Quebec another. Between them stretched either an impenetrable wilderness or an inland sea. Hence Acadia remained separate from the Laurentian Valley, which was the heart of Canada, although Acadia and Canada combined to form New France. Of these two sister districts, Canada was the more secure. The fate of Acadia shows how much less vulnerable to English attack were Quebec, Three Rivers, and Montreal than the seaboard settlements of Port Royal, Grand Pré, and Louisbourg. It is a striking fact that Champlain had helped to found Port Royal before he founded Quebec. He was not the pioneer of Acadian colonization. De Meaux deserves the praise of turning the first sod. But Champlain was a leading figure in the hard fight at St. Croix and Port Royal. He it was who first charted in any detail the Atlantic seaboard from Cape Breton to Cape Cod. And his narrative joins with that of Le Carbeau to preserve the story of the episode. Although unprosperous, the first attempt of the French to colonize Acadia is among the bright deeds of their colonial history. While the death of de Chastes was most inopportune, the future of the French race in America did not hinge upon any one man. In 1603, fishing on the Grand Bank off Newfoundland was a well-established occupation of Normans and Bretons. The fur trade held out hope of great profit, and the spirit of national emulation supplied a motive which was stronger still. Hence it is not surprising that to de Chastes there at once secedes de Mont. As regards position, they belonged to much the same class. Both were men of standing, with enough capital and influence to organize an expedition. In respect, however, of personality and circumstance, there were differences. By reason of advanced age, de Chastes had been unable to accompany his ships, whereas de Mont was in his prime and had already made a voyage to the St. Lawrence. Moreover, de Mont was a Huguenot. A generation later, no Huguenot could have expected to receive a monopoly of the fur trade and a royal commission authorizing him to establish settlements, but Henry IV, who had once been a Protestant, could hardly treat his old co-religionists as Richelieu afterwards treated them. The heresy of its founder was a source of weakness to the first French colony in Acadia, yet through a Calvinist it came into being. Like de Chastes, de Mont had associates who joined with him to supply the necessary funds, though in 1604 the investment was greater than on any previous occasion, and a larger number were admitted to the benefits of the monopoly. Not only did St. Malo and Rouen secure recognition, but La Rochelle and St. Jean de Luz were given a chance to participate. De Mont's company had a capital of 90,000 livres, divided into shares, of which two fifths were allotted to St. Malo two-fifths to La Rochelle and Saint-Jean-de-Luz conjointly, and the remainder to Rouen. The personal investment of de Mont was somewhat more than a tenth of the total, as he took a majority of the stock which fell to Rouen. Apart from Sully's unfriendliness, the chief initial difficulty arose over religion. The Parlement of Normandy refused to register de Mont's commission on the ground that the conversion of the heathen could not fitly be left to a heretic. 
This remonstrance was only withdrawn after the king had undertaken to place the religious instruction of the Indians in the charge of priests, a promise which did not prevent the Protestant colonists from having their own pastor. The monopoly contained wider privileges than before, including both Acadia and the St. Lawrence. At the same time, the obligation to colonize became more exacting, since the minimum number of new settlers per annum was raised from fifty to a hundred. Champlain's own statement regarding the motive of de Mont's expedition is that it lay in the desire to find a northerly route to China, in order to facilitate commerce with the Orientals. After reciting a list of explorations which began with John Cabot, and had continued at intervals during the next century, he continues, So many voyages and discoveries without results, and attended with so much hardship and expense, have caused us French in late years to attempt a permanent settlement in those lands which we call New France, in the hope of thus realizing more easily this object, since the voyage in search of the desired passage commences on the other side of the ocean and is made along the coast of this region. A comparison of the words just quoted with the text of de Mont's commission will serve to illustrate the strength of Champlain's geographical instinct. The commission begins with a somewhat stereotyped reference to the conversion of the heathen, after which it descants upon commerce, colonies, and mines. The supplemental commission to de Mont for Montmorency, as Lord High Admiral, adds a further consideration, namely, that if Acadia is not occupied by the French, it will be seized upon by some other nation. Not a word of the route to the east occurs in either commission, and de Mont is limited in the powers granted to a region extending along the American seaboard from the 40th parallel to the 46th, with as much of the interior as he is able to explore and colonize. This shows that, while the objects of the expedition were commercial and political, Champlain's imagination was kindled by the prospect of finding the long-sought passage to China. To his mind, a French colony in America is a stepping-stone, a base of operations for the great quest. De Mont himself doubtless sought honor, adventure, and profit, the profit which might arise from possessing Acadia and controlling the fur trade in the River of Canada. Champlain remains the geographer, and his chief contribution to the Acadian enterprise will be found in that part of his voyages which describes his study of the coastline southward from Cape Breton to Malabar. But whether considered from the standpoint of exploration or settlement, the first chapter of French annals in Acadia is a fine incident. Champlain has left the greatest fame, but he was not alone during these years of peril and hardship. With him are grouped de Mont, Poutrincourt, Les Carbeaux, Pontgrave, and Louis Hébert, all men of capacity and enterprise, whose part in this valiant enterprise lent it a dignity which it has never since lost. As yet no English colony had been established in America. Under his commission, de Mont could have selected for the site of his settlement either New York, or Providence, or Boston, or Portland. The efforts of the French in America from 1604 to 1607 are signalized by the character of their leaders, the nature of their opportunity, and the special causes which prevented them from taking possession of Norumbega. Footnote. There appears in Verrazano's map of 1529 the word Aranbega, as attached to a small district on the Atlantic seaboard. Ten years later, Norumbega has become a region which takes in the whole coast from Cape Breton to Florida. At intervals throughout the 16th century, fables were told in Europe of its extraordinary wealth, and it was not till the time of Champlain that this myth was exposed. Champlain himself identifies the great river of Norumbega with the Penobscot. End of footnote. De Mont lacked neither courage nor persistence. His battle against heartbreaking disappointments shows him to have been a pioneer of high order, and with him sailed in 1604 Jean de Biencourt, Seigneur de Poutrecourt, whose ancestors had been illustrious in Picardy for five hundred years. Champlain made a third, joining the expedition as geographer rather than shipmaster. Le Carbeau and Hébert came two years later. The company left Havre in two ships, on March 7, 1604, according to Champlain, or just a month later, according to Le Carbeau. Although de Mont's commission gave him the usual privilege of impressing convicts, the personnel of his band was far above the average. Champlain's statement is that it comprised about 120 artisans, and there were also a large number of gentlemen, of whom not a few were of noble birth. 
Besides the excitement provided by icebergs, the arguments of priest and pastor diversified the voyage, even to the point of scandal. After crossing the Grand Bank in safety, they were nearly wrecked off Sable Island, but succeeded in reaching the Acadian coast on May 8. From their landfall at Cap de la Heve, they skirted the coastline to Port Mouton, confiscating en route a ship which was buying furs in defiance of de Mont's monopoly. Rabbits and other game were found in abundance at Port Mouton, but the spot proved quite unfit for settlement, and on May 19, de Mont charged Champlain with the task of exploring the coast in search of harbours. Taking a bark of eight tons and a crew of ten men, together with Rollot, de Mont's secretary, Champlain set out upon this important reconnaissance. Fish, game, good soil, good timber, minerals, and safe anchorage were all objects of search. Skirting the southwestern corner of Nova Scotia, the little ship passed Cape Sable and the Tusket Islands, turned into the Bay of Fundy, and advanced along to a point somewhat beyond the north end of Long Island. Champlain gives at considerable length the details of his first excursion along the Acadian seaboard. In his zeal for discovery, he caused those left at Port Mouton both inconvenience and anxiety. Le Carbeau says, with a touch of sharpness, Champlain was such a time away on this expedition that when deliberating about their return to France, they thought of leaving him behind. Champlain's own statement is that at Port Mouton, Sieur de Mont was awaiting us from day to day, thinking only of our long stay and whether some accident had not befallen us. De Mont's position at Port Mouton was indeed difficult. By changing his course in mid-ocean, he had missed rendezvous with the larger of his two ships, which under the command of Pontgrave looked for him in vain from Canso to the Bay of Islands. Meanwhile at Port Mouton provisions were running low, save for rabbits, which could not be expected to last forever. The more timid raised doubts and spoke of France, but de Mont and Poutrincourt both said they would rather die than go back. In this mood the party continued to hunt rabbits, to search the coast northeasterly for Pont Grave, and to await Champlain's return. Their courage had its reward. Pont Grave's ship was found, de Mont revictualled, Champlain reappeared, and by the middle of June the little band of colonists was ready to proceed. As de Mont heads southwest from Port Mouton, it is difficult to avoid thoughts regarding the ultimate destiny of France in the New World. This was the predestined moment. The wars of religion had ended in the reunion of the realm under a strong and popular king. The French nation was conscious of its greatness, and seemed ready for any undertaking that promised honour or advantage. The Huguenots were a sect whose members possessed Calvinistic firmness of will, together with a special motive for emigrating. And besides, the whole eastern coast of America, within the temperate zone, was still to be had for the taking. With such a magnificent opportunity, why was the result so meagre? A complete answer to this query would lead us far afield, but the whole history of New France bears witness to the fact that the cause of failure is not to be found in the individual French emigrant. There have never been more valiant or tenacious colonists than the peasants of Normandy who cleared away the Laurentian wilderness and explored the recesses of North America. France, in the age of de Mont and Champlain, possessed adequate resources, if only her effort had been concentrated on America or if the Huguenots had not been prevented from founding colonies, or if the crown had been less meddlesome, or if the quest of beaver skins farther north had not diverted attention from Chesapeake Bay and Manhattan Island. The best chance the French ever had to effect a foothold in the middle portion of the Atlantic coast came to them in 1604, when, before any rivals had established themselves, de Mont was at hand for the express purpose of founding a colony. It is quite probable that even if he had landed on Manhattan Island, the European preoccupations of France would have prevented Henry IV from supporting a colony at that point with sufficient vigour to protect it from the English. Yet the most striking aspect of de Mont's attempt in Acadia is the failure to seize a chance which never came again to the French race. In 1607 Champlain sailed away from Port Royal and the English founded Jamestown. In 1608 Champlain founded Quebec and thenceforth, for over a century, the efforts of France were concentrated on the St. Lawrence. When at length she founded Louisbourg, it was too late. By that time the English grasp upon the coast could not be loosened. Meanwhile, de Mont, to whom the future was veiled, left Port Mouton, 
and, creeping from point to point, entered the Bay of Fundy, or, as Champlain calls it, the Great Bay Francoise, so named by Sieur de Mont. The month was June, but no time could be lost, for at this juncture the aim of exploration was the discovery of a suitable site, and after the site had been fixed the colonists needed what time remained before winter to build their houses. Hence de Mont's first exploration of the Bay Francoise was not exhaustive. He entered Annapolis Basin and glanced at the spot which afterwards was to be Port Royal. He tried in vain to find a copper mine of which he had heard from Prévert of St. Malo. He coasted the Bay of St. John, and on June 25 reached St. Croix Island. Not finding any more suitable place than this island, says Champlain, the leaders of the colony decided that it should be fortified, and thus was the French flag unfurled in Acadia. The arrangement of the settlement at St. Croix was left to Champlain, who gives us a drawing in explanation of his plan. The selection of an island was mainly due to distrust of the Indians, with whom, however, intercourse was necessary. The island lay close to the mouth of a river, now also called the St. Croix. As the choice of this spot proved most unfortunate, it is well to remember the motives which prevailed at the time. Vessels could pass up the river, says Champlain, only at the mercy of the cannon on this island, and we deemed the location most advantageous, not only on account of its situation and good soil, but also on account of the intercourse which we proposed with the savages of these coasts and of the interior, as we should be in the midst of them. We hope to pacify them in course of time, and put an end to the wars which they carry on with one another, so as to derive service from them in future, and convert them to the Christian faith. De Meaux's band was made up largely of artisans, who at once began with vigor to erect dwellings. A mill and an oven were built, gardens were laid out, and many seeds planted therein. The mosquitoes proved troublesome, but in other respects the colonists had good cause to be pleased with their first Acadian summer. So far had construction work advanced by the beginning of autumn, that de Meaux decided to send an exploration party farther along the coast to the southwest. And, says Champlain, he entrusted me with this work, which I found very agreeable. The date of departure from St. Croix was September 2, so that no very ambitious program of discovery could be undertaken before bad weather began. In a boat of eighteen tons, with twelve sailors and two Indian guides, Champlain threaded the maze of islands which lies between Passamaquoddy Bay and the mouth of the Penobscot. The most striking part of the coast was Mount Desert, very high and notched in places, so that there is the appearance to one at sea as of seven or eight mountains extending along near each other. To this island and the Ile O O, Champlain gave the names they have since borne. Thence advancing, with his hand ever on the lead, he reached the mouth of the Penobscot, despite those islands, rocks, shoals, banks, and breakers which are so numerous on all sides that it is marvellous to behold. Having satisfied himself that the Penobscot was none other than the great river Norumbega, referred to largely on hearsay by earlier geographers, he followed it up almost to Bangor. On regaining the sea he endeavoured to reach the mouth of the Kennebec, but when within a few miles of it was driven back to St. Croix by want of food. In closing the story of this voyage, which had occupied a month, Champlain says with his usual directness, the above is not an exact statement of all I have observed respecting not only the coasts and people, but also the river of Norumbega, and there are none of the marvels there which some persons have described. I am of opinion that this region is as disagreeable in winter as that of our settlement, in which we were greatly deceived. Champlain was now to undergo his first winter in Acadia, and no part of his life could have been more wretched than the ensuing eight months. On October 6 the snow came. On December 3 cakes of ice began to appear along the shore. The storehouse had no cellar, and all liquids froze except sherry. Cider was served by the pound. We were obliged to use very bad water and drink melted snow as there were no springs or brooks. It was impossible to keep warm or to sleep soundly. The food was salt meat and vegetables, which impaired the strength of every one and brought on scurvy. It is unnecessary to cite here Champlain's detailed and graphic descriptions of this dreadful disease. The results are enough. Before the spring came, two-fifths of the colonists had died, and of those who remained, half were on the point of death. Not unnaturally, 
All this produced discontent in Sieur de Mont and others of the settlement. The survivors of the horrible winter at St. Croix were not freed from anxiety until June 15, 1605, when Pontgrave, six weeks late, arrived with fresh stores. Had de Mont been faint-hearted, he doubtless would have seized this opportunity to return to France. As it was, he set out in search of a place more suitable than St. Croix for the establishment of his colony. On June 18, with a party which included twenty sailors and several gentlemen, he and Champlain began a fresh voyage to the southwest. Their destination was the country of the Armouchiquois, an Algonquin tribe who then inhabited Massachusetts. Champlain's story of his first voyage from Acadia to Cape Cod is given with considerable fullness. The topography of the seaboard and its natural history the habits of the Indians and his adventures with them were all new subjects at the time, and he treats them so that they keep their freshness. He is at no pains to conceal his low opinion of the coast savages. Concerning the Acadian Micmacs he says little, but what he does say is chiefly a comment upon the wretchedness of their life during the winter. As he went farther south, he found an improvement in the food supply. At the mouth of the Seiko, he and Dumont saw well-kept patches of Indian corn three feet high, although it was not yet midsummer. Growing with the corn were beans, pumpkins, and squashes, all in flower, and the cultivation of tobacco is also noted. Here the savages formed a permanent settlement and lived within a palisade. Still farther south, in the neighborhood of Cape Cod, Champlain found maize five and a half feet high, a considerable variety of squashes, tobacco, and edible roots which tasted like artichokes. But whether the coast Indians were Micmacs or Armouchiquois, whether they were starving or well-fed, Champlain tells us little in their praise. Of the Armouchiquois, he says, I cannot tell what government they have, but I think that in this respect they resemble their neighbors, who have none at all. They know not how to worship or pray, yet, like the other savages, they have some superstitions, which I shall describe in their place. As for weapons, they have only pikes, clubs, bows, and arrows. It would seem from their appearance that they have a good disposition, better than those of the North, but they are all, in fact, of no great worth. Even a slight intercourse with them gives you at once a knowledge of them. They are great thieves, and if they cannot lay hold of anything with their hands, they try to do so with their feet, as we have oftentimes learned by experience. I am of opinion that if they had anything to exchange with us, they would not give themselves to thieving. They bartered away to us their bows, arrows, and quivers for pins and buttons, and if they had had anything else better, they would have done the same with it. It is necessary to be on one's guard against this people, and live in a state of distrust of them, yet without letting them perceive it. This passage at least shows that Champlain sought to be just to the savages of the Atlantic. Though he found them thieves, he is willing to conjecture that they would not steal if they had anything to trade. The thieving habits of the Cape Cod Indians led to a fight between them and the French, in which one Frenchman was killed and Champlain narrowly escaped death through the explosion of his own musket. At Cape Cod, de Mont turned back. Five of the six weeks allotted to the voyage were over, and lack of food made it impossible to enter Long Island Sound. Hence, Sieur de Mont determined to return to the island of St. Croix in order to find a place more favorable for our settlement, as we had not been able to do on any of the coasts which he had explored during this voyage. We now approach the picturesque episode of Port Royal. De Mont, having regained St. Croix at the beginning of August, lost no time in transporting his people to the other side of the Bay of Fundy. The consideration which weighed most with him in establishing his headquarters was that of trade. Whatever his own preferences, he could not forget that his partners in France expected a return on their investment. Had he been in a position to find an agricultural colony, the maize fields he had seen to the southwest might have proved attractive. But he depended largely upon trade, and, as Champlain points out, the savages of Massachusetts had nothing to sell. Hence it was unwise to go too far from the peltries of the St. Lawrence. To find a climate less severe than that of Canada, without losing touch with the fur trade, was de Mont's problem. No one could dream of wintering again at St. Croix, and in the absence of trade possibilities to the south, there seemed but one alternative, Port Royal. In his notice of de Mont's cruise along the Bay of Fundy in June 1604, Champlain says, Continuing two leagues farther on in the same direction, we entered one of the finest harbors I had seen all along these coasts, in which two thousand vessels might lie in security. The entrance is eight hundred paces broad. 
Then you enter a harbour two leagues long and one broad, which I have named Port Royal. Here Champlain is describing Annapolis Basin, which clearly made a deep impression upon the minds of the first Europeans who saw it. Most of all did it appeal to the imagination of Poutrincourt, who had come to Acadia for the purpose of discovering a spot where he could found his own colony. At sight of Port Royal, he had at once asked de Mont for the grant, and on receiving it had returned to France, at the end of August 1604, to recruit colonists. Thus he had escaped the horrible winter at St. Croix, but on account of lawsuits it had proved impossible for him to return to Acadia in the following year. Hence the noble roadstead of Port Royal was still unoccupied when de Mont, Champlain, and Pontgrave took the people of St. Croix thither in August 1605. Not only did the people go, even the framework of the houses was shipped across the bay and set up in this haven of better hope. The spot chosen for the settlement lay on the north side of the bay. It had a good supply of water, and there was protection from the northwest wind which had tortured the settlers at St. Croix. After everything had been arranged, says Champlain, and the majority of the dwellings built, Sieur de Mont determined to return to France, in order to petition His Majesty to grant him all that might be necessary for his undertaking. Quite apart from securing fresh advantages, de Mont at this time was sore pressed to defend his title against the traders who were clamoring for a repeal of the monopoly. With him returned some of the colonists whose ambition had been satisfied at St. Croix. Champlain remained in the hope of making further explorations towards Florida. Pontgrave was left in command. The others numbered forty-three. During the autumn they began to make gardens. I also, says Champlain, for the sake of occupying my time, made one, which was surrounded with ditches full of water, in which I placed some fine trout, and into which flowed three brooks of very fine running water, from which the greater part of our settlement was supplied. I made also a little sluiceway towards the shore, in order to draw off the water when I wished. This spot was entirely surrounded by meadows, where I constructed a summer-house, with some fine trees, as a resort for enjoying the fresh air. I made there also a little reservoir for holding salt-water fish, which we took out as we wanted them. I took a special pleasure in it, and planted there some seeds which turned out well, but much work had to be laid out in preparation. We resorted often to this place as a pastime, and it seemed as if the little birds round took pleasure in it, for they gathered there in large numbers, warbling and chirping so pleasantly that I think I have never heard the like. After a busy and cheerful autumn came a mild winter. The snow did not fall till December 20, and there was much rain. Scurvy still caused trouble, but though twelve died, the mortality was not so high as at St. Croix. Everything considered, Port Royal enjoyed good fortune, according to the colonial standards of the period, when a winter death rate of 26% was below the average. At the beginning of March 1606, Pontgrave fitted out a bark of 18 tons in order to undertake a voyage of discovery along the coast of Florida, and on the 16th of the month a start was made. Favoured by good weather, he and Champlain would have reached the Hudson three years before the Dutch, but, short of drowning, every possible mischance happened. They had hardly set out when a storm cast them ashore near Grand Manan. Having repaired the damage, they made for St. Croix, where fog and contrary winds held them back eight days. Then Pontgrave decided to return to Port Royal, to see in what condition our companions were whom he had left there sick. On their arrival Pontgrave himself was taken ill, but soon re-embarked, though still unwell. Their second start was followed by immediate disaster. Leaving the mouth of the harbour, two leagues distant from Port Royal, they were carried out of the channel by the tide, and went aground. At the first blow of our boat upon the rocks the rudder broke. A part of the keel and three or four planks were smashed, and some ribs stove in, which frightened us, for our bark filled immediately. And all that we could do was to wait until the sea fell, so that we might get ashore. Our bark, all shattered as she was, went to pieces at the return of the tide, but we, most happy at having saved our lives, returned to our settlement with our poor savages, and we praised God for having rescued us from the shipwreck, from which we had not expected to escape so easily. This accident destroyed all hope of exploration to the southward until word came from France. At the time of de Mont's departure, the outlook had been so doubtful that a provisional arrangement was made for the return of the colonists to France, should no ship arrive at Port Royal by the middle of July. In this event, 
Pontgrave was to take his people to Cape Breton or Gaspé, where they would find trading ships homeward bound. As neither de Mont nor Poutrincourt had arrived by the middle of June, a new bark was built to replace the one which had been lost on April 10. A month later Pontgrave carried out his part of the program by putting aboard all the inhabitants of Port Royal, save two, who were induced by promise of extra pay to remain in charge of the stores. Thus sorrowfully the remnant of the colonists bade farewell to the beautiful harbour and their new home. Four days later they were nearly lost through the breaking of their rudder in the midst of a tempest. Having been saved from wreck by the skill of their shipmaster, Champ d'Or, they reached Cape Sable on July 24. Here grief became rejoicing, for to their complete surprise they encountered Rallot, de Mont's secretary, coasting along in a shallop. The glad tidings he gave them was that Poutrincourt, with a ship of 120 tons, had arrived. From Canso, the Jonas, had taken an outer course to Port Royal, while Rouleau was keeping close to the shore in the hope of intercepting Pontgrave. All this intelligence, says Champlain, caused us to turn back, and we arrived at Port Royal on the 25th of the month, where we found the above-mentioned vessel and Sieur de Poutrincourt, and were greatly delighted to see realized what we had given up in despair. Le Carbot, who arrived on board the Jonas, adds the following detail. Monsieur de Poutrincourt ordered a ton of wine to be set upon end, one of those which had been given him for his proper use, and gave leave to all comers to drink freely as long as it lasted, so that there were some who made gay dogs of themselves. Wine-bibbing, however, was not the chief activity of Port Royal. Poutrincourt at once set men to work on the land, and while they were sowing wheat, rye, and hemp, he hastened preparations for an autumn cruise along the coast of Florida. On September 5 all was ready for this voyage, which was to be Champlain's last opportunity of reaching the lands beyond Cape Cod. Once more disappointment awaited him. It was decided, he says, to continue the voyage along the coast, which was not a very well considered conclusion, since we lost much time in passing over again the discoveries made by Sieur de Mont as far as the harbour of Malbert. It would have been much better, in my opinion, to cross from where we were directly to Malbert, the route being already known, and then use our time in exploring as far as the fortieth degree, or still farther south, revisiting upon our homeward voyage the entire coast at pleasure. In the interest of geographical research and French colonization, Champlain was doubtless right. Unfortunately, Poutrincourt wished to see for himself what de Mont and Champlain had already seen. It was the more unfortunate that he held this view, as the boats were victualled for over two months, and much could have been done by taking a direct course to Cape Cod. Little time, however, was spent at the Penobscot and Kennebec. Leaving St. Croix on September 12, Poutrincourt reached the Seco on the 21st. Here and at points farther south he found ripe grapes, together with maize, pumpkins, squashes, and artichokes. Gloucester Harbour pleased Champlain greatly. In this very pleasant place we saw two hundred savages, and there are here a large number of very fine walnut trees, cypresses, sassafras, oaks, ashes, and beeches. There are likewise fine meadows capable of supporting a large number of cattle. So much was he charmed with this harbour and its surroundings that he called it Le Beauport. After tarrying at Gloucester two or three days, Poutrincourt reached Cape Cod on October 2, and on the 20th he stood off Martha's Vineyard, his farthest point. Champlain's chronicle of this voyage contains more detail regarding the Indians than will be found in any other part of his Acadian narratives. Chief among Poutrincourt's adventures was an encounter with the natives of Cape Cod. Unlike the Micmacs, the Armouchiqua were not so much hunters as good fishermen and tillers of the land. Their numbers also were greater. In fact, Champlain speaks of seeing five or six hundred together. At first they did not interfere with Poutrincourt's movements, even permitting him to roam their land with the body of Arcbousier. After a fortnight, however, their suspicions began to become manifest, and on October 15, four hundred savages set upon five Frenchmen who, contrary to orders, had remained ashore. Four were killed, and although a rescue party set out at once from the bark, the natives made their escape. To pursue them was fruitless, for they are marvelously swift. All that we could do was to carry away the dead bodies and bury them near a cross which had been set up the day before, and then to go here and there to see if we could get sight of any of them. But it was time wasted. 
therefore we came back. Three hours afterwards they returned to us on the seashore. We discharged at them several shots from our little brass cannon, and when they heard the noise they crouched down on the ground to escape the fire. In mockery of us they pulled down the cross and disinterred the dead, which displeased us greatly and caused us to go for them a second time. But they fled, as they had done before. We set up again the cross and reinterred the dead, whom they had thrown here and there amid the heath, where they kindled a fire to burn them. We returned without any result, as we had done before, well aware that there was scarcely hope of avenging ourselves this time, and that we should have to renew the undertaking when it should please God. With a desire for revenge was linked the practical consideration that slaves would prove useful at Port Royal. A week later the French returned to the same place. Resolved to get possessions of some savages, and taking them to our settlement, put them to grinding corn at the hand-mill as punishment for the deadly assault which they had committed on five or six of our company. As relations were strained, it became necessary to offer beads and gewgaws with every show of good faith. Champlain describes the plan in full. The shallop was to leave the bark for shore, taking the most robust and strong men we had, each one having a chain of beads and a fathom of match on his arm, and there, while pretending to smoke with them, each one having an end of his match lighted, so as not to excite suspicion, it being customary to have fire at the end of a cord in order to light the tobacco, coax them with pleasing words so as to draw them into the shallop, and if they should be unwilling to enter, each one approaching should choose his man, and putting the beads around his neck, should at the same time put the rope on him to draw him by force. But if they should be too boisterous, and it should not be possible to succeed, they should be stabbed, the rope being firmly held and if by chance any of them should get away, there should be men on land to charge upon them with swords. Meanwhile, the little cannon on our bark was to be kept ready to fire upon their companions in case they should come to assist them, under cover of which firearms the shallop could withdraw in security. This plot, though carefully planned, fell far short of the success which was anticipated. To catch a redskin with a noose required more skill than was available. Accordingly, none were taken alive. Champlain says, We retired to our bark after having done all we could. Le Carbeau adds, Six or seven of the savages were hacked and hewed in pieces, who could not run so lightly in the water as on shore, and were caught as they came out by those of our men who had landed. Having thus taken an eye for an eye, Poutrecourt began his homeward voyage, and, after three or four escapes from shipwreck, reached Port Royal on November 14. Champlain was now about to spend his last winter in Acadia. Mindful of former experiences, he determined to fight scurvy by encouraging exercise among the colonists and procuring for them an improved diet. A third desideratum was cheerfulness. All these purposes he served through founding the Ordre de Bon Temps, which proved to be in every sense the life of the settlement. Champlain himself briefly describes the procedure followed, but a far more graphic account is given by Le Carbeau, whose diffuse and lively style is illustrated to perfection in the following passage. To keep our table joyous and well provided, an order was established at the board of the said Monsieur de Poutrecourt, which was called the Order of Good Cheer, originally proposed by Champlain. To this order each man of the said table was appointed chief steward in his turn, which came round once a fortnight. Now this person had the duty of taking care that we were all well and honorably provided for. This was so well carried out that though the epicures of Paris often tell us that we had no rue aux heures over there, as a rule we made as good cheer as we could have in this same rue aux heures, and at less cost. For there was no one who, two days before his turn came, failed to go hunting or fishing, and to bring back some delicacy in addition to our ordinary fare. So well was this carried out that never at breakfast did we lack some savoury meat of flesh or fish, and still less at our midday or evening meals, for that was our chief banquet, at which the ruler of the feast, or chief butler, whom the savages called Atokajek, having had everything prepared by the cook, marched in, napkin on shoulder, wand of office in hand, and around his neck the collar of the order, which was worth more than four crowns, after him all the members of the order carrying each a dish. The same was repeated at dessert, though not always with so much pomp and at night, before giving thanks to God, he handed over to his successor in the charge the collar of the order, with a cup of wine, and they drank to each other. I have already said that we had abundance of game, such as ducks, 
bustards, grey and white geese, partridges, larks, and other birds. Moreover, moose, caribou, beaver, otter, bear, rabbits, wildcats, raccoons, and other animals, such as the savages caught, whereof we made dishes well worth those of the cook-shop in the Rue aux Eures, and far more. For of all our meats none is so tender as moose-meat, whereof we also made excellent pasties, and nothing so delicate as beaver's tail. Yea, sometimes we had half a dozen sturgeon at once, which the savages brought us, part of which we bought, and allowed them to sell the remainder publicly, and to barter it for bread, of which our men had abundance. As for the ordinary rations brought from France, they were distributed equally to great and small alike, and, as we have said, the wine was served in like manner. The results of this regime were most gratifying. The deaths from scurvy dropped to seven, which represented a great proportionate decrease. At the same time, intercourse with the Indians was put on a good basis thereby. At these proceedings, says Le Carbeau, we always had twenty or thirty savages, men, women, girls, and children, who looked on at our manner of service. Bread was given them gratis, as one would do to the poor. But as for the Sagamos Membertu, and other chiefs who came from time to time, they sat at table eating and drinking like ourselves, and we were glad to see them, while on the contrary their absence saddened us. These citations bring into view the writer who has most copiously recorded the early annals of Acadia, Marc Le Carbeau. He was a lawyer, and at this date about forty years old. Having come to Port Royal less as a colonist than as a guest of Poutrincourt, he had no investment at stake. But contact with America kindled the enthusiasm of which he had a large supply, and converted him into the historian of New France. His story of the winter he passed at Port Royal is quite unlike other narratives of colonial experience at this period. Champlain was a geographer and preoccupied with exploration. The Jesuits were missionaries and preoccupied with the conversion of the savages. Le Carbeau had a literary education, which Champlain lacked, and, unlike the Jesuits, he approached life in America from the standpoint of a layman. His prolixity often serves as a foil to the terseness of Champlain, and suggests that he must have been a merciless talker. Yet, though inclined to be garrulous, he was a good observer and had many correct ideas, notably the belief that corn, wine, and cattle are a better foundation for a colony than gold or silver mines. In temperament, he and Champlain were very dissimilar, and evidence of mutual coolness may be found in their writings. These we shall consider at a later stage. For the present, it is enough to note that both men sat at Poutrecourt's table and adorned the order of good cheer. Meanwhile, de Mont was in France, striving with all the foes of the monopoly. Thanks to the fur trade, his company had paid its way during the first two years, despite the losses at St. Croix. The third season had been much less prosperous, and at the same moment when the Dutch and the Basques were breaking the monopoly by defiance, the Hatters of Paris were demanding that it should be withdrawn altogether. Footnote. Basques. Traders from the extreme south of France, whose chief port was Saint-Jean-de-Luz. Though living on the confines of France and Spain, the Basques were of different racial origin from both Spaniards and French. While subject politically to France, the remoteness from the main ports of Normandy and Brittany kept them out of touch with the mariners of Saint-Malo and Havre, save as collision arose between them and the Saint Lawrence. Among the Basques there were always interlopers, even when Saint Jean de Luz had been given a share in the monopoly. They are sometimes called Spaniards, from their close neighborhood to the Pyrenees. To this alliance of a powerful guild with the majority of the traders, the company of de Mont succumbed and the news which Poutrincourt received when the first ship came in 1607 was that the colony must be abandoned. As the company itself was about to be dissolved, this consequence was inevitable. Champlain, in his matter-of-fact way, states that de Mont sent letters to Poutrincourt, by which he described him to bring back his company to France. Le Carbeau is much more outspoken. Referring to the merits and struggles of de Mont, he exclaims, Yet I fear that in the end he may be forced to give it all up, to the great scandal and reproach of the French name, which by such conduct is made a laughing-stock and a byword among the nations. For as though their wish was to oppose the conversion of those poor western peoples, and the glory of God and of the king, we find a set of men full of avarice and envy, who would not draw a sword in the service of the king, nor suffer the slightest ill in the world for the honour of God, but who yet put obstacles in the way of our drawing any profit from the province, 
even in order to furnish what is indispensable to the foundation of such an enterprise. Men who prefer to see the English and Dutch win possession of it rather than the French, and would fain have the name of God remain unknown in those quarters. And it is such godless people who are listened to, who are believed, and who win their suits. O tempora, o mores. On August 11, 1607, Port Royal was abandoned for the second time, and its people, sailing by Cape Breton, reached Roscou in Brittany at the end of September. The subsequent attempt of Poutrecourt and his family to re-establish the colony at Port Royal belongs to the history of Acadia rather than to the story of Champlain. But remembering the spirit in which he and de Mont strove, one feels glad that Le Carbeau spoke his mind regarding the opponents who baffled their sincere and persistent efforts. End of chapter 2